What's up, guys? This is Mega Talks. I'm Chris Thompson. Join me as I talk with interesting people of the world, from musicians to athletes to automotive enthusiasts, and much more. I'm Christopher Thompson. This is the Mega Talks podcast, and I want to thank you guys for listening. Also, I want to remind you guys that hadn't been listening to go back and check out episode one, where I speak with Eric Heath. He's the maker of Jit Scripts. If you don't know what Jit Scripts are, they're a great training tool to improve your grip, not only in Jiu-Jitsu, but for some of you weightlifters out there. So go to JitScripts.com and check those out. Episode two, I talked to a great guy. Uh, His name is Craig Hanaumi. He's a police officer in Bellevue, Washington. We speak about his outreach programs up there. He's a martial artist, also a skateboardist. And, um, two great guys, two great interviews, so make sure you go check it out. And we're pretty much fresh off a week from UFC 211, which produced some great matches, some interesting setups for the future for some fights going on in the UFC. You should have seen Frankie Edgar with a great stoppage over Yariad Rodriguez. They gave a great match. Also, Joanna Jacek retains her title over a tough Jessica Andrade. That fight produced a great battle. They ended up with a great heavyweight match between Stipe Miocic retaining his title over Junior Dos Santos with a knockout win. One of the more interesting setup matches on that card, you had Damian Maya getting a win over Jorge Masvidal. And Damian Maya is looking for the title shot against Tyron Woodley, which he was promised directly after the match. We'll see what the future holds at the 170. 185, everybody's looking for Michael Bisping to take on George St. Pierre. That division may may be held up, maybe not. We may see that match. It's kind of questionable about when it's coming. We also have another questionable match between Conor McGregor and Floyd Money Mayweather. So it's kind of a race to see which match is going to get made first. Will it be Bisping and St. Pierre? Will it be McGregor versus Mayweather? And speaking of UFC, leads into my next interview. My next interview is with uh, Tracy Lee. You may know her as Miss Tracy Lee, but she's um, done some work in the UFC. She's been a photographer on the scene for a while. The legendary photographers in the MMA world. And she's also an adventurer, a canyoneer, uh, does many things. But we get into some of her adventures. So stick around and make sure you are following her on Facebook at Tracy Lee Photos or over on Instagram. But um, I'll put all those links in the show notes for you. But sit back, enjoy the interview. All right, this is Christopher Thompson. I'm here with Mega Talks, uh, doing the podcast today with a great guest I've made contact with in the past. Her name is Tracy Lee. You may know her as Miss Tracy Lee from uh, either Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, you name it. There's a, an abundance of websites and abundance of pictures, and she's making her mark in history uh, through social media and the networking in and out of the whole world. How are you doing today, Tracy? I'm doing great, thank you. How's it going, Chris? Thanks for having me on your podcast. Oh, you're welcome. It's a um, pleasure having you here, and uh, thank you for taking the time. Um, you know, when I was first started forming the podcast, you was one of the people that I had in mind that I wanted to know I wanted to talk to because I know you're um, got a lot of things going on, and you know, kind of a pioneer and somebody, you know there's anybody out there watching they can take a lot of notes from you and learn a lot of things um well thank you i appreciate that oh you're welcome sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there oh no it's no problem let's um let's get to the point i know you're a photographer why don't we go back and start at the beginning you know um kind of how you grew into being a photographer 
Wow, you know, that's a hard question to answer because there's so many different points from, like, age 16 or 17 that photography crossed my path and to, to where I'm at now. But I wouldn't say that it was, like, straight photography all the way through. The um, photography is of a sort is what brought me to Vegas, but it was just point-and-shoot shooting nightlife stuff. And that brought me out to Vegas. And then somewhere in the midst of that, I was like, you know what? I think I could do this photography thing, like, on the real. So I ended up buying, you know, um, a digital SLR. And um, although I had had, I had had a film SLR when I was younger, so it's not like I, it, that was new to me either. Um, but I, I got a digital SLR and started, you know, doing portrait photo shoots. And, you know, uh, that eventually led into me getting involved in the MMA industry and shooting fights, which I started shooting fights. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have the right kind of lenses and so on and so forth. So that was a, that was a learning experience as well. But when I was getting into photography, I probably read every article, every book, everything I could possibly find on, you know, how to shoot and how to um, use my camera. So um, it's self-taught, but not, I guess, because I use books and, um, books and internet, but at the mm-hmm. same time, it was also a lot of trial and error. That's a, that's a big task for, for photography. I've taken a few classes, but I mean, uh, from the work that I've seen you do, I mean, it goes, um, you test the limits. You know, I mean, it, it, it's one thing to take a class. I mean, I think that th- there are some portions of me, some parts of me that regret not going to school for it. And that's probably for the business side of it more than anything. Uh, but as far as the creative side of it, I think that you can't teach that part of it. Yeah. You just that you just kinda have to have it. The technical aspect of it, you know, you're always learning, but the creative side of it, you just kinda have to have that. So I guess I, I've had that a long time. But it, it's funny because I'll go back and say, Well, I'm creative but I'm I don't see myself as artistic. So I guess uh-huh. I have a I know that sounds really weird, but I have a different outlook. It's like when I look at things that I consider artistic mm-hmm. I think they're very different than what I produce. And that's probably one of the things that helps set you apart from the, the rest. You think so? Oh, yeah. I, I, mean, wish, that I wish I was artistic. I wish I was artistic. But no, I, I feel like I am creative. And I feel like, um, here's how I describe it when I talk about my photography. I'm very opportunistic. Uh, I'm not conceptual. So when I think artistic, I think people are conceptual and they, they conceptual conceptualize their images in advance. Me, I take a situation out of what is in front of me and then I create something from what I see in front of me versus... So you kind of mold create. the clay. Somebody sets some clay down in front of you and you mold it into a, uh, the way you want it. Exactly. Instead of... Um, it, 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 that means that I, I take the pieces that have been set in front of me instead of bringing the pieces to the table. Nice. And I feel like an art, an artist is is someone that would bring all the pieces to the table. Now, did you start so, uh, specifically with digital or did you ever do like um, f- uh, film negative or anything like that? No, no, no. I started on film. That's, that's what I, um, yeah, I started on film and I was shooting skateboarding and actually skateboard photography taught me composition ironically. And I mean, skateboard photography helped me in MMA photography for sure. So I've been, I would say that I've been an action sports photographer for a good part of my life. Um, but it was the skateboard photography that caught, that taught me how to compose photos because photos, um, I noticed, and I did this as a new photographer, um, shooting skateboarding. Um, you tend to like get a skateboarder and you shoot him in the air and he's in the air, but you don't see anything else. They're like, wow, he's high in the air, but you can't tell as, as a viewer of that image, you can't tell because there's no story to it. And that's where I learned composition is like, I had to show where they were coming from or where they were going to, to give a frame of reference oh, yeah. to what was the image. 
So my first few shots of super photography, I'm getting this guy in the air, but you can't see what else is going on. So you had no idea. So that was a big learning experience. And mm-hmm. that taught me, that taught me, um, you know, it taught me a lot about composition and photography. And I mean, you could take that into iPhone photography, like people with iPhones that want to, you know, come up with better images. There's just, you, you just have to make sure you're telling a story. Oh yeah, that's and for it sure. Doesn't, it doesn't mean, you know, center your people or center, you know, your, your focus. Cause you got the rule of thirds. Your, yeah. The rule of thirds. That's, that's a lot to go into for just people who don't know photography, but yeah, the rule of thirds is is important. And I mean, again, I learned that just by default by figuring out to tell a story. So that means not necessarily centering the photo around the subject. Now, um, did you skateboard also? Since you, I did a little bit. I did skateboard a little bit. I I did um, in the skateboard park on um, their ramps, I didn't like street skating because I didn't like falling on concrete. <laughs> so, so, and it's funny because I have scrapes and bruises on my knees. I have a cactus thorn in my finger right now. I mean, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely a mess right now. Um, and that's just because of all my crazy adventures I always go on. But mm-hmm. again, that was the whole reason I didn't like, you know, street skating on concrete is because I end up with scrapes and I have scrapes on my knees, scrapes on my shin. I, I have bruises all over. It looks like, it looks like I'm a victim of domestic violence all over my body, but not. <laughs> you sound like Constantly. some of our students in jujitsu class. <laughs> I, you know, when I did jujitsu, I wore those bruises. I had bruises on my chest all the time. And okay. I wore those as badges of honor. Those were my badges of honor. Like, the life even though, experience. Even though most people didn't realize they did jiu-jitsu and they just saw all these bruises all over my chest. <laughs> and they're probably like, what the heck? This chick <laughs> must be my friend or I don't know. They're wondering yeah, who's no. touching you up. I was actually thinking about the bruises today and I'm like, yes, I would wear a skirt and I would show off the bruises and scrapes. Oh, yeah. There's nothing people, wrong with that. Then let people ask what they're from. I'd be okay with that. Oh, yeah. And some some of them probably still wouldn't know if you told them. If somebody, some of them was I'm sorry? Oh, I said some of them probably still wouldn't know if you told them. Right. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I love the fact that I'm out there um, getting dirty at for lack of a better term, I'm out there getting dirty. My fingernails are not perfectly manicured, although I do have pretty okay nails. But <laughs> And that's what it says on your profile is it adventure. And uh, coming from your photography, just making the transition from skateboarding, to, and you started shooting some MMA or the fighting and things like that. Uh, how did you break in? I understand skateboarding, you may not. Uh, necessarily have to be credential. You could be uh, working with individual skaters, but making the break in or uh, breaking into the industry of MMA and you know combat sports. Um, tell us what led you there. Um, how did you make that transition? Well, like I said, I was doing nightlife photography, and so um, every time I put up a, 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 a an album from a fight after party. It just the traffic went huge, and I had already made friends with a lot of fighters by then, you know, um, from shooting the after parties. So uh, it just was, I was seeing how much attention that was getting, and, you know, I took that somewhat as an opportunity, but I really enjoyed it, too. So I went to a couple fights. It was a blast. I had a magazine I worked with that was able to get credentials, so I started getting credentials. Again, had no idea what I was doing. But mm-hmm. I dove in, I dove in head first, started traveling to all these fights. And, you know, I'm just, I, I'm just, I'm a good learner and I love photography. So I feel if you know your camera, you can eventually end up shooting any type of photography. Obviously, it takes practice to get at, get good at particular ones. But if you know your camera well, you can shoot anything. That's for sure. Because I found it difficult just, you know, if you're cage side, you're trying to shoot through the fence. 
and that's a little tough in itself because the focus isn't where sometimes where it needs to be. I'm not sure if you shoot uh, um, automatic or are you shooting on the fly where you make the adjustments yourself. Um, I shoot uh, fully manual. Mm, that's I shoot autofocus, but I shoot fully manual. So, um, the uh, you know, it's constantly changing my settings and it's constantly moving. And um, you know, though once you once you have if they've evenly lit the cage, once you have your settings down for that evening, you don't have to change the actual settings. You're just refocusing a lot. Mm-hmm. Do you do you remember the first fight that you shot, uh, with the fighters? Um, the first fight I shot, um, it was somewhere around February of two thousand. Well, no, the first fight I shot was from the stand. It was Bonner versus uh, Griffin two. That was August of two thousand six. Nice. And I just had my camera in the stand and I shot that. So that was kind of exciting. Uh, the next one I shot after that was probably February of 2007. Um, I had gotten credentials. I think I more ran around and did the social thing because I didn't realize at first, I didn't realize my credential didn't get me cage side. Oh, so okay. it got me in an overhead position, which I went and I was like, okay, this sucks. I hate being up here. <laughs> so <laughs> I, just went, I just went around and ran around and socialized. Uh -huh. And then um, eventually I got to the point where I, you know, it wasn't so much the running in all my friends thing. It was definitely about the photography thing. And I was very, very passionate about it and very passionate about ca catching what I called the um, defining moment of the fight. Mm -hmm. now and that was really huge. If there was, you, you know, I, we keep talking the same I'm time. Sorry? I'm sorry. <laughs> you got it. What were you asking? Oh, I was just saying, um, you have uh, shot the the nightlife. Was there a website for the nightlife um, separate from combat lifestyle? Yeah, that was napkinnights.com. Okay. Yep. Because I was thinking there was there was two of them, but I quite wasn't sure. Yeah, actually, I started I started uh, I started the MMA stuff on mma.napkinnights.com, and then I broke it off onto its own site, Combat Lifestyle. And you do, but, you also manage the website too. Uh, yes. Hmm. I didn't, I didn't, I built the first versions of some of those websites, but, um, then, you know, we, we, we as a team created a, our own software to, uh, upload photos and, and so on and so forth, um, and create our own photo, photo galleries. So, I mean, uh, napkin is kind of up still, combat lifestyle, I have since stopped updating. I did it from good many years though. Mm -hmm. Now taking on photography too, and taking on like website design, is that something that was uh, like self-taught, or did you go to school for that? Or self-taught on that too. I'm an autodidact. I teach myself pretty much anything I want to know. That's nice. I can understand <laughs> I, that. <laughs> I try and research anything I can. And I'm really good at finding things on the internet. So. Mm -hmm. Now taking um, pictures, um, napkin nice MMA combat lifestyle. Um, what what's the most memorable fight that you've ever shot? Maybe it's the most um, not to say popular pig, but maybe something that's um, stands out for you. I mean, what's oh what's your goodness. number one? That's, I shot. I would say I shot 200 fights. Like. The amount of credentials I have hanging on my wall is insane. Like, I shot well. I was, I mean, and I'm just guessing numbers. I, I would say I shot 200 fights. I probably shot 140, 150 UFC and WC events. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, shot, yeah. I, I mean, I, for, for a good seven, eight years, I went everywhere the UFC did pretty much. And, like, what, I've been to... Uh, I went to Abu Dhabi. I went to Australia three times. I went to Japan three different times. I, I you know, I went to Germany a, a couple times. I went to, you know, London a couple, a few times. You know, so I've been all over the world. I took well advantage of all the traveling I was doing for fights to also see the world, which was great. Mm -hmm. So 
it was it was a great experience, a great part of my life, something I would never give up for the world. It was absolutely awesome. I met some incredible people. I have a network all over the world as well as results. So it's been phenomenal. Cool. And what, was there a, uh, like a... I'm sorry for my sniffling. I have really bad allergies. Oh, well, I understand that too. You can probably hear me. I'm I'm usually nasally, so I have I have allergies too, so I know how that um that battle goes. One day I'm talking normal, the next day I'm just I'm all hoarse. Well, um you don't sound too stuffed up right now. Oh, I have a microphone, so I'm trying to EQ my my voice and use a a decent voice. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than my day-to-day voice, I guess you would say. You don't want to hear that. <laughs> uh, so is there like a, maybe a, a number one photo or top photo that stands out of, among all those events? Um, let's see. So, it, yeah, anyway, so when you were asking if there was a, an event that stood out, and, I mean, there there definitely were, were a couple of things that really stood out, like the first time that we did uh, a fight at the Bell Center in Montreal, walking in there at the start of the entire event. You know, in Vegas, people don't show up to the fights until almost the main card. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like, what, seven, eight fights on the undercard. But a lot of times people don't show up till the, you know, main card. So the first time we went to Montreal, and it might have been one of the first Canada fights altogether, but um, the first time we went to Montreal, walking into the Bell Center with 23,000 people and having it be completely full before mm-hmm. the first fight started was mind blowing. It was, it was, it was, it was incredible to feel the energy in that place. And you know, I have to admit that the energy in the overseas fights was always, always more than in the United States ones. Yeah, so the Canadians really brought it. Yeah, for sure. And one of I think one of my more memorable pictures uh, was the knockout of Chuck Liddell by Rich Franklin. Oh, okay. That's where he, yeah. um, Rich uh, Franklin got his arm that, broken. That was Jan, June tenth of two thousand and ten. Mm. I think. I think two thousand. Probably. Yeah, I think because it's, it's I been a bit. It doesn't seem like that long ago, but I know it it has been. Yeah, seven years. It was seven years ago. Yeah, I know and uh um I just I just I, it, I think it was a shock. It was it was a, a definite surprise. Rich Franklin had the broken arm. I remember him being seeing him next week with a pink cast on, you know, cuz he pink mm-hmm. with his thing. Mhm. And you know, he signed he signed a copy of that photo. You know, you have taken the most memorable photo of my career. Oh yeah, so that one that nice. one stands out. I actually have a wall of photos, poster sized photos in my hallway that are some of the most memorable, like knockout, like I said, defining moments. Uh-huh. Either knockout or or the the one single picture that defined a fight. I have those hanging in my wall, signed by the signed by the athlete. Like I have, uh, I have a couple of Anderson Silva ones. It is Anderson mm. Silva versus Kale Sonnen on the triangle choke in oh, front of me. Oh, yeah, that's classic. Uh, I have Anderson uh, doing the front kick on um, Vitor Belfort, which is really ironic because um, on that photo, probably six of us got that image. Oh, really? And um, yeah, uh, maybe five, five mm-hmm. or six of us got. Was the identical same image. It was just a millisecond difference in time. And uh, James Law actually, I think, got the best image out of all of ours because uh, Anderson's foot was dragging across the face, so it gave a mm. really, like, it's the one that ended up on the, uh, I think it ended up on the video game, and it ended up, it, it ended up in a bunch of places his photo did. Mm-hmm. My photo fo- my photo is very similar to that, but just the timing is, like I said, a millisecond off. Nice. And it, that makes all the difference. But, it, you know, combined together with the combined effort, you guys, you know, are, you know, making history or capturing the history of the moment. And that's important because um, a lot of people, you know, you you have those memories, but when you can go back and take a, a still shot and, you know, freeze that moment, 
as opposed you know video is going to do a different thing but you know you guys are taking frozen shots out of history and preserving them for everybody to see later yeah i have quite the um quite the archive that's for sure yeah i bet you got a good museum that you could um, make out of all those photos what did you say i said you'd have a pretty good museum uh, with all the photos Right. And, oh my God, I can't imagine trying to even go through all those and organize. I mean, they're organized by date, so I I always can find photos that I'm looking for. One of my oldest drives, though, took a crap, so I can't ex- mm. I can't access the 2007 photos right now. So I'm trying to figure that out. I just realized that the other day. How, how many backup systems do you have? Um, on that, I. Sh- I looked for my backup drive. I see. I tried to make backups of every single drive, mm-hmm. and I looked for my backup drive, and I didn't find it. So I don't know if it got misplaced or I never made one. Because mm-hmm. we're talking ten years. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now taking that from um, fighting, and you know, you have other. You said you have about four or five other photographers there at the event. Was that pretty? Consistent from an, one event to the next, five or six? That I had four or five, or there were four or five? Oh, uh, the four or five, just, you know, not necessarily working with you, but, I mean, at the event. Um, no, there was, uh, there used to be 16 on the cage, eight on each side. Oh, man. What, how was the competitiveness between the photographers, you know? Um, did you have a, you know, battle for space or battle for a moment or anything like that? No, we were assigned a spot, so there was not really a a competition in regards to that. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it just, I, I wouldn't say that there was a huge competition. Obviously we want to get the best shot, but I, I personally never felt like there was a competition. If I, if, if I felt that way, I probably wouldn't have mentioned that I thought James Law had the best image from that. So, right. Oh, yeah. I know how some of the, you know, they talk about media or events or, you know, just, uh, you know, general newspaper photographers, you know, they're going after a certain shot or something. Sometimes they're shoulder to shoulder, you know, they're battling out trying to get the best shot. But, I mean, they're all after one thing. Just wondering if it um, kind of got tight cage side. Because I know there's a lot going on around the cage um, in any fight that's going on. It's a lot going on between judges and referees and announcers. Yeah, typically as far as the photographers were set in our location and that was our spot and, you know, that was it at the end of the day. You know, it wasn't, we weren't typically elbowing for space. Although, I mean, we were crammed tight in there, but it was usually pretty good. And um, the, what was your most recent fight? Because I know you don't, you don't shoot as many MMA or maybe UFC events as you used to. Uh, what, what's been your last fight i did the last ultimate fighter finale so whatever season it was i ended up shooting the the finale and it was a last minute thing for um usa today images Mm, okay so that i mean i would i would i would love to um shoot again you know they changed out credential photographers i would love to shoot the fights again because even though it had been three years since I had last shot a fight at that point um, I I felt that it was like riding a bike Mm -hmm. you know I had I I picked it right up again so that being said um, I would love to but I don't miss how broke I was oh yeah yeah because so many of us did it so many people do MMA for the passion of it. They mm-hmm. love it and they're involved in it. And that's what passion is, right? You do it because you love it. Oh, yeah. And that, that, that is a lot of the reason why I did it. And as a result, you know, there's not a lot of money in it. I, or not at least at the level I was at, I was broke all the time. Mm. Not and good so if you need I, equipment either. <laughs> right, exactly. It was expensive equipment and being broke all the time. It that part wasn't fun. So um, yeah, I'm 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 happy to not be involved for that reason. But I missed 
the people and the camaraderie and the, the, the fighters and just being involved in all that, that part was great. Mm -hmm. Now, Noah, you made a, a pretty good stamp, um, you know, coming from the neck and nights to the MMA, um, photography and hanging out with, um, the fighters and people, but you also do, um, I read on your, your bio, you're a social media junkie, but I've heard you talk about that, um, you're kind of a social media guru, if I'm not mistaken. I get hired by companies and clients to run their social media. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've been doing social media from before it was even called that. And um, I figured out recently, within the last week or two, like I actually sat down and counted it, I probably update about consistently 23 accounts a day. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, a lot of people don't. They, a lot of people think that um, that I don't work at all because I'm always <laughs> adventuring and I'm always posting content. Uh -huh. But I actually work quite a bit. And I, I just don't, as we talked before, I don't sleep a lot. Mm -hmm. But that, That's what so, makes you the entrepreneur and the adventurer because um, you do what you love and, you know, you do it well and is your lifestyle and you and that's your way of survival too yeah so i i definitely i definitely um work hard i just don't the thing is is because i don't have a traditional job mm -hmm. it's like i can't can't really post my job on on instagram or facebook because my job is posting on Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm. and, every, <laughs> so and everybody wants hard, to see the it's hard, to, it's hard to be like, hey, here's me at work or here's me at lunch uh, during work, you know, is like, it, it's... Sitting at a computer those, or something? Those kind of photos really don't exist. It's like, I'm not posting pictures of me behind my computer. <laughs> I mean, when I do shoot, when I do shoot, when I do photography, you know, I'll, I'll post pictures like if I... I'm working for a client and, you know, a lot of my clients that I shoot photography for love it when I post on, on my social media that I'm working for them. Mm -hmm. So I do, I definitely do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Cause I remember the, you know, throughout the evolution of technology, social media, whatever you want to call it, I've seen apps come and go and I've seen you adopt some apps and, you know, they've kind of, um, put their stamp in, in time and, maybe moved on but i remember you know you streaming, i mean streaming live yeah videos. i did live i did live streaming i started here's the crazy part about it not taking credit for any you know for being first or anything because it existed but i started live streaming in 2009 we're talking eight years ago mm -hmm. like some people just started live streaming like last year you know, and I, I started live streaming when I was on tour with Tap Out. So I went on a tour mm -hmm. bus with Tap Out, and we um, we would have one of those MiFi routers, the hotspot routers. We had one of those on the bus. We hooked up my laptop to it, and we would, while we were driving down the road, we would live stream. It would be me and Scrape because Punk Ass was driving. And then whatever cider we happen to have, or we would walk into, if we stopped for gas, we'd walk in with a laptop in hand and we'd be streaming in the, you know, the truck stop or whatever. I've got, oh. I, I actually can go back and see those videos. They're on my YouTube channel still from, from oh, really? back then. So, yeah. It's so crazy. It's so crazy that, I, that, that is still there and it still exists. That, that was but, your YouTube? Yeah, we, is that Miss Tracy Lee? YouTube? No, it's on the Combat Lifestyle YouTube, I believe. Okay. I have to go back, yeah. way back, to see those. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a way back. You're talking eight years ago. So, but that stuff. So, I mean, I started live broadcasting then, but live broadcasting was a really good um, tool. There was a big gap, though, from that kind of live broadcasting till apps started coming out for live broadcasting. And when the apps came out, you know, I got approached by some companies and I started working with different companies um, and I had access to, you know, great content. Mm -hmm. And that was live broadcasting with the fighters. And so I did that for a while. 
then by the time, you know, Facebook finally adopted live broadcasting, I kind of was over it. Oh, and, yeah. you know, live broadcasting at this point, I don't see a ton of people doing it. A little bit. No, just a little. A little bit, but not a lot of it. Like, I think also a lot of people got a really bad taste in their mouth of live broadcasting after the guys broadcast a murder a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, when that happened, a lot of people just, just I think, turned their back on it of sorts. Yeah, you never know what you're going to see. And, you know, um, if you're the one doing the broadcasting, you don't, you don't have any kind of control over what's going to happen. Yeah, and I mean, I can't say that people don't live broadcast because people do. Mm-hmm. But I also don't think it was, it, it was as big as it started to be. And and part of the thing is about live broadcasting is that, or at least say, say Instagram, for example, when you post a live broadcast on Instagram, it doesn't allow you to save it and it doesn't allow you to say what the broadcast is about. Yeah. So when someone I know ends up broadcasting 10 times in one day, guess what? I'm not even going to click on it because I'm like, I don't know what it's about. And they're just broadcasting silly stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I thought so, that Instagram was actually going to change that, but I hadn't heard any kind of updates about it. If they were going to have it where you can save it or post it up. I don't know. Pretty I really probably, don't. I don't know from kind of what you see you, there may be a lot of wasted space if they let people post it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what they would do, and I don't know if they would change it or not, but I do know that um, I just, I just, I perhaps lost interest in it, and I thought it was going to be really big at one point. And it, I mean, it, it had its little little time, and mm-hmm. who knows, it might, it might not be over. Just like, I mean, people are doing the whole VR thing, the virtual reality oh, thing. Yeah. Like, I love that Facebook allows us to upload panels so we can look around them. Um, I think that the VR thing is really tough because a lot of people, like myself, get motion sick sick from it. Oh, you do? I get motion sick. There's a good percentage of people, I think one in five, that get motion sick Mm -hmm. from virtual reality. And I could be wrong on that stat, but I think it's pretty large. Now, have you so had I, uh, experience with the um, VR, the video games, or anything like that? Yeah, I can't play any third-person or first-person shooters. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Even third-person shooter is questionable, but first-person shooters, I I can't, and not not even VR ones. Just mm-hmm. first-person shooters like Call of Duty and you know all that kind of stuff. I can't play those video games because I get motion sick. I can't watch home videos, I can't watch Blair Witch Project, I can't watch Cloverfield because that is um, in first person, it makes me motion sick. It's really hmm. crazy. I've, I've heard that, but I've never tried the VR. Now I've heard they're, I mean, like a better terms, they're way behind, but I mean, there's any technology they can advance pretty, pretty fast, but I heard the technology is, they had the potential for it all to be better, it's just not where it needs to be yet, I guess. You know I, I mean, about. you know, just because of my my nausea I get, it, it would definitely keep me from spending too much time using, you know, virtual reality products of any kind. You know, and I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated. I can't wrap my head around um, 360 video. I'm absolutely fascinated by it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that that's going to take off either. You know, I don't see it making a huge a huge, uh, I guess, any huge advances with the with the 360 video. Mm-hmm. There was an incredible one. I think Nissan made a whole commercial using 360 video, and it was great to see. It was a Star Wars one. It was so cool. But yeah. I feel like because of 360 video, if you're trying to get a point across, you kind of unless people are able to fully engage and watch it over and over again, which I don't think a lot of people will, like you, you, there's a good possibility they miss what part of it is that you, they want that you as the, uh, as the company or advertiser want them to see. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, you've known me long enough. You know me, I always try out new stuff. I'm always testing out new things to see. Mm-hmm. 
you know, what is out there and what's going to stick. And again, I'm fascinated by the 360 video. I haven't had a chance to play around with the camera too much, but I would like to. Yeah, he's kind of the leader in that, at least for me, you know, the things I, I when I was following you and I watch you do certain things and, you know, do the certain live broadcast, maybe this app or that app and um, something that's um, that I've been watching you do r really here lately is um, the adventure in the um, uh, sky photography or the night shooting that you're, uh, you're doing. Yeah, that has taken off for me huge. Mm -hmm. And um, if you know what's really cool, there's a video camera out there that can film the Milky Way. It's got like 400,000 ISO. It's insane. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, no, the night photography thing started. I started. Um, uh, an Instagram account about a little, probably 14 months ago now. Mm -hmm. um, we're at almost a quarter of a million followers. Yeah. And we have a Facebook group that's really huge. And it, it, again, it ties back into my photography. It ties into my photography background and my networking background. So it's a combination of, of two things that I'm um, passionate about and I'm good at. And it, it, it it succeeded. And you never know what's going to succeed. That's the thing. you got to mm -hmm. keep throwing the wall and dig and see what sticks, right? And so um, I try not to to half-ass when I when I do do, you know, new things. I try and give it a go mm -hmm. and see what works out. And that, that particular one worked out really well. Now, have you combined any of the night shooting um, with, like, the, I know you said 360 video, but more or less the... Um, I guess virtual reality type of any that, that aspect. You know, there's a lot of people on my group, on my Facebook group, mm -hmm. that um, they do 360 degree panos of the Milky Way, but um, the video camera that films the Milky Way is quite expensive, so it's not a, it's not a camera your common person on the street would have. <laughs> I mean, I don't see, foresee myself ever having one of those, but, I mean, it'd be cool to play with one for sure. Does it look like a regular camera? As far as the appearance? Um, I haven't, I don't even know. Hold on, let me let me Google real fast. All right. Because I know that's just strange. Even as a kid, you know, growing up, I've always been fascinated with, um, you know, the the night sky and watching constellations, you know, yeah looking through the telescope at different things, but something I never had the opportunity to do was uh, to actually, you know, take pictures of the night sky because we just didn't have the um, the means to do it, I guess you would say, or the quality of the cameras to do it. Anything that you took was just like a little white streak or a black dot. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I actually have seen a picture of this. It does not look like your common camera. It, mm. looks, like, it looks like a cube. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Yep, and the price tag on it is twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, is um, it's not for. It looked like a GoPro. No, it's not a GoPro. <laughs> oh okay, I didn't it's know if it had that shape. Probably, I'm gonna say it's uh maybe a six inch, eight six to eight inch cube. Oh, that's weird. I guess it has to be. I mean, because it's not doing your your common uh, job of videoing. Have, have, right, you, it's, have you seen the GoPros that um, do the, I guess, the 360? Uh, do they have a new GoPro, or are you talking about the, the GoPros mounted, like 12 GoPros mounted on a rig? Yeah, they're like 12 mounted on a rig, you know, at, at all angles. It looks like a little, yeah. like you could roll a ball down somewhere and... At least that's what it looks I like to me. I feel like uh, archaic at this point because now there are um, devices that will film 360 on one device rather than um, 12. 12 gold mm -hmm. at four or $500 a pop. Oh, yeah. Now, um, speaking of GoPro, which companies do you think are, I mean, do you rep a company or do you would you recommend a company if somebody's getting into photography or maybe somebody's, you know, already into it, and they're looking for really high-level equipment. For uh, night photography? Uh, just 
maybe something that would do a little bit of both or maybe you can recommend something that you know you can do action on and just um, night photography also well I, I shoot Canon and I've been shooting Canon for many years uh, they do not pay me to say that <laughs> although I would love it if they did um, oh, they I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually I, I wish I had pursued it more when I was you know cage side shooting photos uh, a Canon sponsorship that would have been fantastic mm-hmm. um, I I'm actively pursuing that as of now, nice. and it took probably four or five years pursuing my um, lens and tripod sponsor to get sponsored by them. So I think that if I put my effort in four or five years from now, perhaps I'll be sponsored by Canon. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, I know that those are lofty goals, but if you don't set goals, you don't achieve them, right? Yeah, so, uh, that's for sure. Uh, I'm a big fan of Canon. And I'm impatiently waiting a new model Canon to come out, which is the 6D Mark II. Um, hmm. It's kind of a camera that a lot of people don't know about, mm-hmm. but it ended up being the most popular astrophotography camera in Canon's line. So um, I'm waiting for the Mark II. I almost bought the, the original one, and then I realized the Mark II is supposed to eventually come out. And... Um, it has the features that I really love about my lower end model of Canon that I shoot with right now. Mm-hmm. So uh, I get great results out of that camera. So I can't wait to. They, see they what should happens. send you an early bird. Right, that would be great. Mm-hmm. I have to figure. I, I'm, I'm just trying to get on their radar right now, which I, I mean, I kind of am a little bit through social media. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. That that's just that's just my goal is to potentially eventually be sponsored by Canon. But right now I'm sponsored by Tokina Lenses, which mm. is uh, my go-to lens for shooting uh, the night sky. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I shoot, I use it, I use those for almost everything. Um, and then I'm sponsored by Slick Tripods, which um, they, you know, since coming on with them, I have three different Slick Tripods and um, not including the ones I already had prior to coming on with them. So mm-hmm. I have four at this point. And then um, Hoya Filters, uh, casually sponsored. I'm not a full member of their team, but they do send me stuff. Mm-hmm. And then um, most recently, I have a co- uh, case relay being sent to me by Tether Tools, which will allow me to use my um, my uh, USB, what's it called, battery? You know, the ex- external batteries that you get, the bricks mm-hmm. and stuff that you charge your phone with, I'll oh, be able okay. to charge my phone with that. Hmm. That's pretty cool. You can use a product called a case relay. So I'm looking forward to receiving that. I should be getting it really soon, um, which is great because I have a number of adventures planned for the month of May, which I like doing time lapses or star trails, and that means that I can do those. Right now, I do a star trail until the battery runs out, which is about three hours. Oh, okay. And I would love to be able to do a five to six hour star trail. Because mm-hmm. I, um, I, I which, see those shots on the, I guess you post some of those on the Instagram and I've seen those. Yeah. And they're just a massive, it's just, it's just seeing what happens if you were to see the stars actually move, like where they would move. You see them move in a circle mm-hmm. around the North. So, um, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to that case relay coming. It, they just emailed me, said they shipped this week. So, mm-hmm. now, how does your um? Do you take all your equipment out when you go, um, like on a hike out in the desert? No, I don't. I, I recently did a picture of Four Flicks and Tokina of all my equipment, and I didn't realize I have a lot. <laughs> and so, um, when I go out to the desert, you know, I, I definitely take two bodies with me, so I have at least two lenses, but all that stuff, and it's funny, when I sent them the picture, I didn't know if they were going to approve it, they asked me, what do you, what's in your bag, what do you take with you, and Mm -hmm. the two things most people probably wouldn't realize that I do take with me, one is my gun, and then Uh the other is is my jet boil, Uh and so my jet boil, so I can cook food in the middle of the night, or if it's cold, I can cook soup and keep myself warm. And then my gun is for protection. So, uh, unfortunately, obviously, I can't take it to California with me. But I, um, when I'm in Utah, Arizona, and Nevada, I'm 
golden. Mm-hmm. So I have my gun with me, and that's part of my kit. Cool. Those are pretty necessities when you're out there in the middle of nowhere. You don't what know. Did you say? That's a necessity when you're in the middle of nowhere because you don't know who or what type of animal or anything you may run across. Exactly. Well, now you mentioned carrying the gun. You're also a shooter. <laughs> yeah. Not, not just with the cameras. <laughs> I, I have to clarify that a lot because people are like, oh, you're going out to the desert to shoot. Mm-hmm. And that can be one of two things. Either film or gunpowder. I mean, that's what's in my photo, photos, you know. So, um, yeah, no, I have a whole Instagram for my guns, but I have not been updating that as of lately. Oh, yeah. And I, I got to get back on that. Because, I, I mean, just snowboard season ended, Milky Way season started. Mm-hmm. It, just got, it just got really busy. So I just haven't been shooting lately, but I need to. So that's, that's one thing I've been thinking about a lot this week. Yeah, I'm sure to come around again once the you know, uh, star season kind of dies down. I guess you would say, or the the season changes, the sky's going to change. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's funny because my snowboard season is uh, typically end of November through uh, end of February or so, maybe March, mm-hmm. and my Milky Way season is March or end of February or March through end of October. So it fits <laughs> pretty perfectly. And then I canyoneer. Canyoneering, I can do all year, year long, but typically I do that more summertime to fall. Mm. Now that keeps you going back to back with all the with activities. For, that keeps you going back to back from all the activities between the snowboard, canyoneering, uh, just Milky Way chasing. And then just, you know, other adventures or events that come up? Yeah, it's, I mean, it is nonstop back to back. I just, you know, I've been home for a week now almost. I got home last Tuesday night, so I've been home almost a week. And it's been the first, like, straight week I think I've been home in a while. Mm. Prior to that, I was on four back to back trips. Mm hmm. Shoot. Yeah, um, when you go and like you're, you're shooting maybe in the desert. Do you shoot? I mean, it's obviously you shoot at the same time that you do the hikes or canyoneerings. Um, yeah, do I shoot photos? Yeah, that, yeah. I, all my trips are kind of focused around. Um, are kind of focused around the shooting the Milky Way, but they I always look for ones that are extensive adventures together. Mm-hmm. What what type of uh, I guess I'm looking for uh, what since you're going on an adventure what's what, you ever experienced a hairy moment like one moment out in the desert or somewhere and you think well maybe you know this is it I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it out of here or make it back or you know your biggest obstacle to overcome No I I am pretty I'm really good at planning and making sure that I'm in um good situations um, I haven't, I haven't, not that I can think of, that I, and you, you would definitely remember something like that, I think. Um, I don't, I can't think of any time where I was. Because I know there are some times that you said, you know, your phone's done and you have a couple of phones or maybe, you know, you're out of juice. I, I carry three phones. Oh, you got three now? <laughs> yeah. I carry three phones. Um, a lot of places go, believe it or not, actually the phones somewhat work. Not everywhere. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, so I mean, I I really um, can't think of any any bad situations. That's cool. And uh, Horseshoe Bend, is that your favorite spot? I love going to Horseshoe Bend, but I would not say it's my favorite spot. Oh, really? I do enjoy going there. I go out of my way to go there. Mm-hmm. What, For what, sure. What is your favorite? Um, people would probably think Havasu Falls based on the fact that I go so much. But no, it's not Havasu Falls. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will just use the term Utah. 
Oh, yeah. Utah is my is my favorite. Just going to Utah because there's so much to explore there. I love Moab. Moab is a great area. I love Escalante. Now those are all right on the um, the state border, right? Uh, Escalante is kind of on the border, but Moab is a little bit more northeast. Oh, okay. But I feel like Moab is a magical place. Hmm. What do you think gives us um, this magic? What do I think? To matter? It's just like, it's just, it, it attracts a, a, a ton of very like-minded people in it, just the amount of beauty and the amount of places you can explore are almost endless there. Hmm. Cool. Every trip that I go there, it's always different. And I've been three times this year already. Mm -hmm. Now, are you doing... Um I know you said you had the YouTube channel. You're not doing a whole lot of video as far as like the uh, canyoneering or anything, are you? A video of the canyoneering? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Because I know I see the you know Instagram posts every now and then, but I didn't know if there was um separate YouTube or anything like that for that spe uh, specific event. No, I, I don't have anything that I like. I mean, I'll post a video here and there. I might have a couple of videos, but there's no special YouTube for it or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it probably kept you on the line a little bit, a little bit longer here, but I'm going to get you off here, and um, you know, so you can get back to your your busy day. Because I know you probably have some things planned and things that you need to get done. Uh, Always do, but what, what what else did you have to ask? I was just going to ask you, um, and I know there's going to be a few different sites, and I'll put some in the show notes. Where can people follow you at? Uh, yeah, I have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at Miss Tracy Lee is my original Instagram account, and I've been updating that for, I don't know, four years. Um, and then... Tracy Lee photos is where you can see your work, my work, but it's really not photos of me. And then I have one that doesn't even have my full name on it, but I have one called Narcissistic Nomad, and it's just all my adventure photos. So some of those I post on Miss Tracy Lee, but I have way more that I don't post on there mm -hmm. that are on that are, are on Narcissistic Nomad. So. Now, how did you get the how did you get the name for that one? Because there seems to be a story. Because it's like me posting pictures of myself, which is pretty narcissistic. So, <laughs> a lot of selfies. I'm not not selfies <laughs> like holding the camera myself, but they're all pictures of me. So yeah. All right. Um, don't you you still have the Milky Way chasers? Yes, I do have that one, but that's not any of my photography. That's me featuring other photographers. Oh, okay. All right. And there's um several areas that, you know, that I could get in asking you questions about, but I think it would take like three or four hours to do. So I think we'll get, we'll cut it off there and, you know, let everybody know where they can follow you. And those that don't know you have a good introduction to who you are and what you've done and kind of where you're going. And, you know, to be able to watch out and see more of your work or more of your adventure. Because I know there's some things that I'm probably not going to get a chance to do in life, that, but I can, you know, live vicariously through you doing them and um, observe that. So that um, I like following along and watching the adventure. Well, I appreciate that you are interested in that and you follow along. And um, I just, I just love putting content out there interesting content so i i think i appreciate everybody that gets involved in it and engages with it and um and likes it at the end of the day i mean and i really really genuinely appreciate that and i try i try my hardest to respond to everybody if i can oh well, you do, you're doing a great job because this is you know some people wouldn't expect you to respond you know as busy as you are and I understand that sometimes I see your response and I'm like, oh, maybe she's not busy. Maybe she, you know, she's up to something, you know, if she's yeah, posting like or said, it's adventuring. Hard, but I try to. I try to. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Well, I'm going to um, 
get you out of here and um maybe we'll do it again sometime but um everybody go out there follow miss tracy lee or tracy lee um check the show notes um for some of her links in there because you don't want to miss this stuff especially if you're an aspiring photographer you just admire um the stars um the lifestyle the combat lifestyle mma um you need to take note go out there and um you know experience history if that even makes sense experience history i said if that even makes sense but you know after it's um after it's videoed and is photographed it's, it's a part of history Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're saying the old stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, it, let me know if you find that stuff because it's so <laughs> I, rem- I I can specifically remember there's a Robbie Lawler one. Oh. In there. Yeah, and I don't remember who else, but there's a few videos on there. Uh-huh. So. All right. What, it's been great I, talking I to you. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. I know we kind of rambled and we went all over the place with it, but oh, yeah. I guess that's kind of kind of you know a good representation of of my life like i'm all over the place doing all different kinds of things so because mm-hmm. i hope it wasn't yeah that's like i was saying there's the there's the snowboarding and the shooting and photography and oh uh, shoot there's a few more things but um you know those have to be for other days to talk about maybe <laughs> well for sure so, uh, again, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate it. And there you have it. An awesome interview with Tracy Lee. And I want to thank her again for taking the time out of her day to give me the interview. Also, for you guys, if you want to follow her and her work, I'm going to include in the show notes the links. And if you're downloading this episode from iTunes, be sure to give me a review in there. And as always, subscribe and share this with your friends. I'm Christopher Thompson. Thank you, guys. Peace out.